Thanks everybody for coming to this um, workshop session. Really happy to, to, to be presenting to you today. We're going to talk about a few things um, around the power of connected data, digitizing the workspace, um, what Symbiotics have done at Bart's Health. And we've got Eileen here today and we're really happy to have her here because uh, there's a lot going on at Bart's Health with strikes and everything else. So just really privileged to have Eileen taking the time out of her busy schedule to come and talk to us today about the, what we did when we insourced that contract um, from, from Serco. So we're going to touch on that. And we've also got Gareth Hughes here um, who was previous head of estates and facilities at Health Board in Wales. Um, and he's going to be talking about our new CAFM solution uh, which we're launching along with soft services. So for a long time, Symbiotics was involved in um, only soft services, port and catering, domestic monitoring, and we've been working with some, some trusts over the last couple of years to develop a, a CAFM solution, and we genuinely believe that um, the total facilities management solution, which we've, we've been presenting upstairs on the board, and has got some really positive feedback from people, is, is, is the way forward with integrated technology. So rather than having multiple disparate systems in, in various different formats with various different databases, having a single platform that covers all of those systems is, is, is the way forward, because having systems talk to systems, you've got to have the data formatting in the right way, You've got to have separate user banks, separate databases for locations, and having that whole thing um, un under one platform, is, it, it really helps to bring that data together and bring some data visualizations together, which enables you to uh, enhance patient flow and, and manage your services in a way that is more intuitive and insightful. And hopefully, um, Eileen, along with the team that we've put together there at Bart's, will be able to evidence some of that in the way that that, that, that contract was delivered. Um, so just to talk to a couple of those points here, um, so having one platform, again, that covers all the systems um, allows you to, um, to, to, to not have to manage multiple banks of users um, and allows you to have um, a single data view with a dashboard that covers portering, catering, cleaning. So one service manager at the top of the chain can look down on that and, 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 be, and be able to um, make data insights into, into, the, into those systems so that you can see exactly what's going on. What we're working with now, um, and, and a lot of um, other companies I'm sure are doing the same, everybody's got the buzzword of AI around that. So what does AI actually mean um, in this space? Well, we're collecting the amount of portering jobs that you're doing. We're collecting the amount of cleaning jobs that you're doing. We're collecting how many cleaners are on shift at any one time. And with the power of AI, you can look into that data on a daily basis and update your schedules and update your health roster and update all of your systems with, with actual data analytics that have just flowing out of the system. And that's what we're trying to build is an, is a, is an architecture where a single system can provide you with your, your resourcing data, your cleaning data, it allows you to manage your consumables, and I think that Symbiotics having all of those platforms under one roof is the only system out there at the moment that can currently do that. But I don't want today just to be um, a purely sales pitch piece around Symbiotics, which is why we've got Eileen in to talk about her experiences and what she had to do in order to implement digital systems on a broader scale, because it's no point me just saying Symbiotics are the best and actually we can, we can look after all your problems. We can, by the way. But but actually, if you, you're going to need to have certain things in place in order to go through that digitization journey. So we've experienced it over the years when we, we got the national contract to run the uh, National Catering Information System in Scotland. And it's been a big challenge because a lot of the boards and places that we work with weren't necessarily ready to go on that digitization journey. And it's one of the things that I think Eileen got right when we went into BARTS. And one of the things I wanted to sort of talk about most when, we, when, when she does a presentation today is, is around what it takes to implement digital systems, because we all know that the NHS isn't often the most forward thinking. You've got legacy people and legacy systems out there that are hard to wrench yourself away from. So what do you need to do to, to, to make sure that the, the, the ground has been laid in order that then you can start on that digitization journey and start to reap some of these benefits? The big thing that we're looking at at the moment, and, and Eileen and I are working on a separate project for this, is around patient flow and around patient optimization. So being able to discharge a patient on a single platform, the porter turns up, the cleaner turns up, that bed's then been put back into circulation. So it's that optimization, and again, just having that all under one roof and being able to speak to other systems, um, it, it offers a huge, huge benefit. So as part of the Symbiotics portfolio, uh, we've got porter, porter tracking um, and asset tracking, which is a new piece that we're getting into now. And that covers medical device trackers as well. Um, and that's based on now location services and, and, and the help desk system. We've also got the domestic services system, uh, which we're going to come on to do a little bit of a deep dive into what that looks like with the national standards of cleanliness as well. The catering um, and the electronic meal ordering system, which everybody, we were here, I don't know, six months ago to do the EMO presentation. A lot of people are coming on that journey with us. Linen, audit and compliance. And, and Gareth's going to talk a little bit around what that means now for hard services. So if you do a, a rectification fail in the cleaning system, that can then speak to an estate system 
system automatically without you having to raise two jobs and move that job around the system. Um, and that's also got an asset tracking um, element to it, which can be linked to the SFG um, senior uh, the uh, SFG register 20 um, for the PPMs. So I'm going to just introduce Eileen now, who's going to talk for you how that symbiotic system was implemented at BART's. Um, obviously, they, they were outsourced to Serco uh, for, for a number of years, um, and then that was decided to be brought back in-house, and Eileen established a team that I can, I can let you, or let Eileen talk for myself. I can talk ad nauseum, those, those people that know and love me, um, about what we're doing at, at BART's, um, but just to give you a little bit of a background of what, what we've been up to for the last 12 months. Um, Circa, who were our provider um, and had been our provider for almost seven years, served notice on BART's 18 months ago um, for convenience. They wanted to um, uh, focus on other areas um, of their business. Um, so BART's board of directors undertook a, an options appraisal and took the very, very brave decision that actually they wanted to insource every single service back um, into BART's health because they believed in the importance of the staff that worked in Soft FM. Um, all of us here know the absolute value that our, our porters, our cleaners um, deliver to our patient care. Uh, so it was a really, really uh, incredibly brave decision. At the same time, Bart's also decided that they were offered a gender for change terms and conditions to all of those staff coming in. So that's how I ended up at Bart's. Um, Bart's argues um, against Manchester that it's the largest trust in the UK, and I'll let the clinicians and the board of directors um, argue that. But um, it's five very, very large hospitals across London. Um, the Royal London Hospital is the largest ED department in Europe. It also is the base of the London Air Ambulance. Uh, St. Bart's itself is one of the oldest, well, it is the oldest hospital um, in the UK, and we've just celebrated our 700th um, anniversary this year. Um, with Circo, there were 18 different and disparate systems that managed um, the uh, jobs that were logged for the whole of Soft, Soft FM, and that included portering, catering, cleaning, logistics, deceased holding, um, help desk, reception, security. Uh, so plus five million annual transactions each year. Those are reactive transactions. Those are not the planned transactions um, with it. So um, it was quite a, a complex project that we had to undertake within, oh, I've gone the wrong way, which way? Yep, within um, that 12 month period that we had. Um, we adopted a, a digital first uh, approach and strategy through the whole of the soft FM insourcing um, uh, because we wanted to understand our business from end to end. Um, there was no legacy of uh, transaction analysis or business analysis in BART's because Soft FM had been outsourced for 17 years. So we had none of the understanding of our business. We had none of the understanding of the peaks and troughs of our business. And what I wanted to be able to give back to the business was really a, an enterprise level of management information um, and reporting. Um, but actually to understand what our business was in real time because these five million transactions are reactive um, what I wanted to understand was that could we start to forecast um, based on the peaks and troughs over the year um, over the the working and the surgical day as well but I also wanted to put in um, some real-time efficiencies as well because there was an increase in our payroll costs of between 16 and 18 percent um, because the board took the decision to actually give everybody a gender for change terms and conditions so what we had to ensure that actually within our project and resource team was that we had um, a skill set to match the project, and that wasn't IMT skills. IMT look after the infrastructure of the hospitals, they look after the Wi-Fi um, for the hospitals. Um, uh, the way that I describe them is they may be the mechanics um, that build the F1 car, but actually what I was looking for were the drivers that understood what the car could do and also understood the track. Um, that the car was having to drive around. So I put together a very, very highly skilled team of uh, digital, I call them the digital eagles, um, but these were people who had real um, experience and knowledge of working within Soft FM, not only within the NHS, but also um, with external providers and, in, and within the commercial world. We also took the decision through the project to actually use a phased approach. Circo had given us a, um, a transfer date of the 1st of May. Very quickly after joining, um, I felt that that was absolute madness to try and transfer 2,000 staff and 18 disparate systems on, on one day. So with agreement of the board and agreement with Circo's board, we actually took a phased approach on that. We st actually started to transfer um, the staff and the systems across from the 1st of November, um, leaving just the two biggest services to transfer on the 1st of May, which were cleaning and catering. The reason that we did that is we wanted to take learning um, and improve each transfer that we did um, 
Also, the um, use of health roster was something that our Circo managers and leaders weren't, weren't used to. Um, Circo had its own system. So we knew that there would be an awful lot of training, not only on the NHS systems of Oracle for finance and health roster for um, labour scheduling, but also the integrated platform that we wanted to put together, which turned to be sy symbiotics. So we also knew that we'd have to dedicate a huge amount of time and energy and resource setting up the training and the planning for that. However, ICT are incredibly important in, in any, any project where you're looking to, to launch systems. So we made sure that we embedded a really, really good um, project manager within our team who actually was able to go ahead and, and prepare the ground in terms of things like making sure that Wi-Fi infrastructure was in place. And again, um, in the last 12 months, we've had a lot of approaches from other trusts who are saying, you've insourced, can you just share with us some of the learning that you've um, um, taken from that? And one of the big learning that I will give you is that you need to ensure not only have you got board level approval and oversight, um, but also the board helicoptering for you, um, because any insourcing uh, program that you undertake, you will never have enough time, you will never have enough hours in the day um, to do everything that you want to do in the time frame that you would want to do it. And sometimes you do have to actually kick the doors down. Um, so you do definitely need board oversight for that. Um, and you'll need to work really, really closely with your IMT colleagues. But your IMT colleagues are not the drivers of the car. They won't actually understand what your system, what you require your system to do. But they will help you with the infrastructure around your hospitals to get that done. Thank you. Um, one of the very, very early meetings that we had, we were told that there is no way that you could roll out an end-to-end -end integrated platform system with, in less than six months and in less than a million pounds worth of spend with a project team to support it. Um, we were laughed at, quite frankly, with the small project team that we had of nine, very, very dedicated, very, very highly skilled, very, very hardworking people. But very, very early on, we realized that actually using a traditional NHS approach of having multiple meetings with 30, 40 stakeholders and it was not going to deliver the project that we needed to deliver um, and actually wasn't going to deliver the systems element of the project either. What we needed was a team, a very small team of very, very highly skilled um, digital eagles who understood our business, who understood what it was like to try and train disparate groups of staff who worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, who absolutely understood that if we were going to deliver training, it needed to be delivered at 6 o'clock in the morning, it needed to be delivered at 3 o'clock on an afternoon of a Saturday or a Sunday, because that was when our staff were here. Uh, we also needed the team to understand and manage the politics between um, clinicians um, and our services teams as well, because um, we all know that actually the strength uh, of clinicians and their power within the boardroom can actually scupper sometimes really, really good projects. Um, so they had to have the political ability as well um, to navigate all of those waters. So actually, um, we delivered it in 35 days from start to finish. And that's not to say that there w wasn't three months' worth of planning, three months' worth of rostering, three months' worth of um, delivering and um, mobilizing devices. We had, I think, over 1,200 devices that we had to mobilize, distribute to staff um, who were unfamiliar with them. Um, get them trained on it, as well as launch um, these systems across five hospitals. And I think it was a five-week program of delivery and training. So we would go into the um, hospitals two weeks in advance, start training, and then do a switch over. One of the things that I was very, very keen to ensure is that we did it very, very quietly. Of course, we let the board know, and of course, we let the clinical leadership and, and the teams know. Um, what was happening, but what we didn't want to do was make massive changes on day one of, of the changeover. So we used the same terminology, and what the other systems did, we ensured that Symbiotics did for us on day one. Uh, we're now two months into that program, and we're now starting to refine and improve um, and actually work really, really hard in terms of collaboration and the development work that we are doing with Symbiotics um, to actually start changing um, how it is that uh, our system is used. For me, it was real-time evidence, literally from one second past midnight on the 1st of May. We started to get really, really rich data back into centre. I can go onto my phone now and I can tell you how many portering jobs are uh, in breach on any one of our hospitals now. I can go onto my phone now and tell you what a patient in bed 16 on ward 60 in the Royal London um, has ordered for their lunch. The work that we're doing now will mean that all of that information will, will flow into the 
patient records as well. So there's huge amounts of work that we're doing with our clinical colleagues as well. Um, so we worked really, really collaboratively um, with Symbiotics. We had great support from our board, uh, but also there was a lot of faith in the knowledge and the skills and the expertise of our digital team that we had um, that managed to deliver, that, deliver this and deliver it really, really well. Uh, so I'm very pleased to say that we launched on the 1st of May, um, so all 2,000 souls safely mapped across to us. All 2,000 souls got, <laughs> souls got paid on the first month as well, which was always a, um, a recognition of success as well. But actually, um, to have launched this system in 35 days without a single transaction being dropped uh, was an incredible achievement for Symbiotics and for our own internal teams as well. And I'm endlessly proud of them and everything that they've achieved. Um, but we know that the work is only really just starting about what we're going to do with this system um, and how we're going to support our patients and improve our patient care going forward. So my last slide is a little bit about um, the BART's values. And the big one about that was actually we worked collaboratively. Um, Symbiotics as an organisation cares passionately about our patients, um, as myself and my team do. This is not a sales pitch that I am going to give you for Symbiotics. This is just the experience that we had at, at BART's. Um, and actually, we're going to grow together, I think, in terms of um, what we will bring to our patients, but also looking to streamline and democratise the information and the data that we can get back in centre that will help us forecast um, what our services need to deliver in the future. One of the key things, and it's not just about symbiotics, it's about any IT solution that you're trying to put in. Having the digital team specialists that Eileen references, the digital eagles or whoever, the, these guys were absolutely key. And it's what we've found anywhere we go if a, a good implementation is managed by a good project manager and someone that understands tech necessarily. So rather than it being the portrait manager or the cleaning manager or the catering manager who's trying to implement the systems, you need to get a systems manager who actually understands what IT is and that digital link between the IT system and the network and places like that. But if you try and do it without that infrastructure in place, it becomes very, very sticky because everybody's talking different languages. The portrait manager doesn't really necessarily understand what IT infrastructure needs to be in place and then when they go to IT, IT just stonewall them. So we've been we were very lucky to have David O'Neill who was that bridge between it but also the digital team who are here today. So just to say a big thank you to those guys for everything that they did in terms of ironing out the kinks and sorting out the data. The other thing is around data capture as well. Um, to, to, to build any digital system you've got to have a clean data set and I've said this when we've been building catering systems or building cleaning systems or portering systems. Trying to cut and paste it from a previous system is often a bit of a folly because you think that you're going to be able to shortcut the process of setting up the whole system, but actually all you bring over is all the problems that were in the previous system into the new system. And this, again, we were very lucky to have some data cleansing people that just understood the, the, the nature of that data and what needed to happen to make a clean system on the back end of it. So we put in the automated porter in a task allocation system. So based on zonal allocation, the system will d dictate who gets a particular job in a particular area. Um, and then everybody's got their own patients, uh, their own specialities. So certain porters can do certain jobs, certain domestics can do certain jobs. And the idea being that this is no longer manual allocation. So the system doesn't care whether you are friends with this porter or that porter so you don't get the dodgy jobs or the bad jobs. The system just automatically allocates based on where you are in the site, the nearest job to you. So it kind of, it democratises the whole process. We've done a job um, recently at one site, and one poor chap hadn't realised it, but he was actually doing all of the jobs, and the other porters were just sitting in the porter office not doing anything. And as soon as the system came in, they were able to see day one that this poor chap has done 37 <coughs> jobs, and everybody else underneath him had done one or two jobs. So it just democratises that process, and the porters actually enjoy it. Although they think you're tracking them, and they think you're looking in on a little bit of a Big Brother thing, actually, the, the ones that were being put upon unfairly in the first instance really enjoy the fact that there's now this sort of leveling of the playing field because the system just is agnostic as to who you are or who you mates with it's just going to send you out a job obviously this is all managed on mobile devices it runs off the tr off of the trust wi-fi um, and i'm just going to nip onto the next slide so that's supported by a help desk so as well as having the manual allocation you can also have a, a standard help desk where you're pushing jobs out and it kind of brings that common sense into certain elements of it where the algorithm just can't be that clever to work out that just common sense this guy knows more about that particular area or these jobs need to be bumped up the thing so you can also have manual allocation on there as well 
Um, we are doing the location and asset tracking. Um, so we're working with a, with another company called Contact.io who are able to utilize Cisco networking, and that will put the um, particular porter or particular <coughs> asset in a, in, a, in a location. So I can now go to a ward and I've got a, got a wheelchair job. It's going to tell me where my nearest wheelchair is to optimize that. And I know at Bart's there's a problem. They've got people that just go around to collect wheelchairs like supermarket trolleys, and they bring them all back to a central point. Well, now in real time, we can see where all of those wheelchairs are across the site. And it's a very simple process of just being able to go and find them and work out where they are. The services hub screen, as you can see here, there's a single point of access for all services. So we've got catering, cleaning, portering, linen, everything that you might want from the soft services division is now accessible from one location on the ward. And you can see here as well, we're also displaying the cleaning standards um, scores at ward level, because one thing that always drove me mad about those cleaning standards is you do all that digital work, and then you've got to print off a PDF that gets blue tacked to the wall, which I never thought was very sort of forward thinking. So you can now see the cleaning scores on these little screens. Um, that can just be a tablet at the nurse station or, or a touch screen that's up on the wall we've got 250 touch screens out across the across the organization and everybody now I think originally it was about a 40% uptake and now it's 80% uptake of using the digital screens rather than calling down to the help desk um, domestic services, so we've got two domestic services systems. One's the National Standards of Cleanliness with the cleaning audit, and any rectification that comes back from that cleaning audit will fall through to the help desk system, so it can be tracked automatically. If there's an estate failure, it goes through to the CAFM system that Gareth's going to come on to talk about in just a second. And we've got the cleaning scheduler system as well. So this has been implemented at BART and a number of other trusts as well, where you can go in with a device to a ward and scan a QR code, and it will tell you all of the things in that ward that need to be cleaned, and it's got all of the stops in there as what needs to happen so before you go in and complete the audit you have to go in and complete the actual cleaning and then the system will flag up okay this ward has been said that it's been or um, it's been cleaned and therefore you can send the audit team on the back of it to actually validate that cleaning that has, that has happened um, we've also got time to clean, so link through to the tablets and the square meterage of the room. It's got all of the different elements that are in there. The system's going to generate you a footprint of the hospital with the square meterage, and it'll also be able to calculate the number of whole time equivalents you need to clean that space. And that's updated in real time by the actual time it takes people to go in and say, I started the job now, I completed the job then. Uh, and, and you've got now real-time data as to how long it takes Mavis to do it, how long it takes Dave to do it, and it, it gives you an average as to how long it should take you to clean any given area in the hospital, and it will give you an, an, an update, whole-time equivalent across your entire site. So again, it's helping you with your rostering, it's helping you know exactly how many cleaners you need in any given area of the hospital at any one time. Um, we've, we've got the catering information system, which is what I've been sort of deep diving into over many years, and some of them might have seen me at the EMO presentations. We've got the national contract for that in Scotland and Wales. Um, it's, it, it covers all of the EMO, but again, having it linked up to the system at, at the help desk will allow you to order out of hours meals. You simply press a button on here, it's going to fall through to the kitchen without you having to log a separate job. So a device in the kitchen will beep to say, I've got an out of hours meal. And again, you can time that and link that to SLAs. So that meal needed to be delivered within 10 minutes, within 15 minutes you can see those breaches in real time on the help desk and the costs are automatically captured back into the system we've also got a security module um, and that security module links up to the waypoints um, so uh, 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 you'd have to walk around the site and check the doors open doors closed and you scan a QR code to say that you're there um, and again you can view all that from the help desk and there's a response element to that as well so if I need to get an emergency porter again I can go up to the kiosk I can press emergency security I can press a button on there and it will send a bleep to a device that will override every other job and the security team scramble to get out there so all of these systems have been employed at the single um, at BART's and they're all speaking to each other and all producing single dashboards of information and at that point I'm just going to pass over to Gareth so for ages we've been known for our soft services and this is what we've been specialising in and we've brought in some expertise from the hard services world to allow us to build a PPM scheduler and asset management system <coughs> to move into the hard services because we just feel that it's a natural progression of the system. A lot of the rules and compliance things that you need to do are, are, are similar in terms of PPMs and cleanliness and SLAs um, and so we've now built that hard services scheduler system into our soft services position again with a single access point so I'll just pass over to Gareth. As Mark alluded to, I think the key element here is this is going to become a kind of one-stop shop. So we've got the host of information for all the soft side, but what was lacking was the kind of CAF and uh, the ability to actually manage the estate. And so what we've been working on uh, over the last probably 12 to 18 months is a kind of integrated CAFM system. So I'm not going to kind of go through all the key points here, but 
what we're doing, in, instead of actually producing a system that works for, for ourselves, is predicated on the fact that we've worked with all the stakeholders, we work with different trusts to actually find out actually what they want, how do they actually want it to work in practice, and then what information needs to cascade through. So there's a real theme in terms of how we're looking at the kind of operational excellence or efficiency of the estate services, looking at how we could do things in a slightly different way. So instead of it being really manually driven, to have a system that can automate it and support it, and in a very simple way, to make it really simple, because I, IT companies, and, and symbolic is different, but IT companies have a tendency to make it really complicated, charge you for absolutely everything, and then everybody's kind of wondering why they're not getting the best out of the system. And this system is designed specifically to work at probably three or four different levels. So it's, it's designed to work at the requester level in terms of any type of thing around reactive work, and then the admin area where they can kind of allocating or automating the actual work, then moving on to the actual technicians actually using it. But it's done in such an intuitive way, it just makes life a lot simpler. And then the data that comes out the back end uh, gives the ability to actually make informed choices and this is why the CAFM system is so key and so different is that it gives you the ability to make informed choices about how you deliver against your estate but it also plays against the 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 benefits that this the system has across the soft side so as you go through if I can you go through it it's be quite small but everything is on one platform and it can be interlinked as Mark said to the other services but you have a uh, a dashboard in terms of so you can see exactly how you're performing in terms of your, your PPM and then you can see exactly how you're performing against your actual reactive. In terms of the PPM, it's all linked back to FST20, so everything is up to date and everything is, is dragged through to ensure that kind of safety element that underpins the whole process, but it gives you a kind of visual view of how you're performing as an estate's function. Uh, underneath there, there's a, if you can see, there's a picture in terms of the reactive side at the same time. So again, instead of clicking everything, if you're going to arrange for a reactive job. It's just a number of things that pre-populate for you, and then there's a number of drop-downs that you just you just click, and it's very simple and very automated. And it seems if you were a, uh, a ward manager or a, an admin person in an area, as well as you actually completing the requesting element, it then sends you an email to say it's been, it's been raised. You've got a dashboard yourself that you can see the progress of the work that's been put online. But then once the work's been completed, you then get an email saying it's been completed, and a survey to ask how well it actually went from the, the requester side. In terms of the dashboard, if you are the, the admin functions, as soon as the reactive tasks come through, they drop through into, you can see at the top there, you've got the reactive, and all you do is you, you pick and drop, uh, and it will only let you give those, those jobs to the most appropriately uh, trained individual, so it just can't go to anybody, so you've got the safeguard already built in. Uh, and the same principle for the PPM, so it releases all the PPMs, and again, you can't issue a PPM to somebody who has the specialty to actually do that, so it's a kind of safeguard that's already built in. Uh, which, which is great. But as, as that flows through, uh, when you actually pass it over, you can put more detail in. And we've we built in the fact that you have to detail if there's a risk assessment required or a permit to work, and it self populates with that risk assessment when it goes to the technician. So it's, there's, there's a number of different elements in how the PPM and reactive work that create those safeguards. So staff just can't go off and do something. And the great thing about the FSG element is the fact that it gives them a full task list of what they actually have to do in terms of all the tasks that creates that kind of safety safety barrier in terms of those elements. Uh, and like I say, everything is digitally driven, so everything is visual, uh, and it is, it is as simple as you just move and drop. It reallocates, it auto-allocates, so it takes the, the time away from the admin team so they can actually uh, be more resourceful in how they produce and work forward. Uh, because we have the assets through SSG, you have a full log, uh, and you have the full history and full audit that automatically updates. And also what is being built in is the fact we're looking at the capital program and life cycling and how you look at the different pieces of uh, assets you have. And depending on their life that's left, the, the ability to understand if you uh, replaced it early, what would that mean in terms of energy or compliance? So it's an automated approach that really gives really valuable information. But it is driven by, in essence, you guys, because it is customer driven. So all the, all the clunky elements that have been found in different systems, and we spoke to the different organizations about, have been smoothed out. So it's a very smooth uh, compliance-based system that takes away the risk, ensures that staff work appropriately, but also allows you to make informed choices about your labor, because it gives the amount of time it will take to do certain PPMs or certain tasks or the reactive jobs. So it'll help you self-populate your rosters going forward and look at your resources depending on what you're actually delivering across the different services. And the great thing is that it also fits in with 
if you're using internal staff as your technicians, uh, but you want to do a minor works element or you want to bring in contractors, it's exactly the same principle. So you drag and drop. Uh, there's, there's a full finance linkage through it, so for the invoicing. Uh, and it will then automatically go to the contractors who will then come to the piece of work for you again. And they can either access it offline or via Padley Pickup from the organisation itself. So again, it's just designed to make it simple in terms of the, of, of the safety element combined with the, uh, the CAFM system. Uh, but attached to this, because this is just around the reactive and the PPM and how we manage those assets, we've also got the modules that, that come with the whole kind of process around energy management, around estates, property and leases, uh, around elements of contract management uh, and also contract management at the same time. So everything's interlinked uh, to ensure that you have a full suite of information that gives you the right information at the right time to make those those informed choices, but then enables you actually to, to put the money in the right place in terms of the, the mix between your, your kind of capital programs and your, your PPM and your reactive. Because if you're getting your PPMs right, you're reducing down your reactive, and if that's good, working well, your capital program will be extended in terms of the, the, you would need the necessity to replace at such a level. So, like I say, the, the best way to see it, we have the stand upstairs. Come and have a look. I mean, we can give you a kind of demo or give you access uh, once you get back to work to actually play around with the system because actually looking at it as, it's, as it moves through the different sections is really interesting to see. I mean, I'm slightly biased, but the system hasn't been designed by, by me or, or Mark and the team. It's been designed by a host of staff across three different NHS trusts. So, and it's what they didn't have elsewhere to what they now have. And it's an evolving process that it's intuitive in what it does. It gives us real time information, but it creates those certain elements of the safety net to ensure that staff are working appropriately to the standard. And because we're using uh, FFG20, everything comes through as an automation. So all change in legislation flows straight through.